do we use technology to build relationships with our students and have an opportunity to bring out the best in them, to help them find success in a way that's meaningful to them? This is the question that I always think about in my learning, and I'm so excited to actually publish this book by Dr. Catlin Tucker and Dr. Katie Novak called UDL and Blended Learning. And it's actually released now. You can see it in the description down below. And I had the opportunity to talk with these two amazing educators who also happen to be good friends of mine. We've built a relationship over our years working together and actually having very similar interests of trying to figure out these, the answer to that question that I asked at the beginning of this introduction. You're going to get some really great strategies of things you could do in your classroom right now. You're also going to learn about some big picture ideas as we move forward and how we can really not only bring out the best in our students, but ourselves, but also it's just a fun conversation. We love to joke around and have some fun. And uh, I, I just love doing this podcast because I have the opportunity to sit with such brilliant minds uh, and, and talk to them about education, but just have some fun. So I hope you enjoy the podcast. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset. Now, before we actually get into the podcast, I am really excited because the Innovators Mindset has its first official sponsor. And this wasn't necessarily something I was working to. I was approached uh, actually several times by different organizations. And this one, I thought, you know, this would be actually great. I'm really excited to be sponsored um, today by eHall Pass. And, and what is actually eHall Pass? And here's just a, a brief description. Schools have been using the same hall pass system for the last 100 years. E-Hall Pass is an innovative, contactless, low-cost, and easily implemented digital tool that helps schools with security, oversight, and social distancing needs. E-Hall Pass can limit hall traffic building wide, can restrict frequent flyers, prevent meetups, and can even prevent locations like the bathroom from overcrowding. E-Hall Pass is a cloud-based tool accessible from any device so no additional hardware is required. Increase instructional time and limit hall abuse. You can also use e-hall pass to make future appointments. A live hall pass dashboard provides adults with real-time insight into hall activity, providing quick support during security incidents. Know who's in the hall at all times. Visit ehallpass.com for more information and to learn about a free, no-commitment pilot. That's e-hallpass.com. Uh, to, to learn more, the hall pass for the future. And if you actually want, you can put the promo code Kuros and it'll just so that you know you were sent there. It's a really interesting solution. Uh, I really appreciate it. I'm going to give them a little shout out for sponsoring today's podcast. So thanks to eHall Pass for sponsoring today's podcast. I hope you enjoy the episode. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast, and we got a very special episode. I don't usually have two guests, but we have a new book coming out with Dr. Catlin Tucker and Dr. Katie Novak, who are both incredible educators, uh, two of leading experts uh, in their respective fields. And what's amazing about this book is called UDL and Blended Learning, and there's a subtitle with it, I'll let you, uh, I'll talk about that, is um, basically... Katie, I've known for a long time, is is basically one of the leading thinkers in universal design for learning. Catlin Tucker is known all over the world for her work in blended learning. And basically, there is this connection between the two. And this is a new book that you, is actually available now. And you can see the link in, uh, in the description down below. So I'm really pumped just to kind of talk about this book, talk a little bit uh, about, you know, your, your experiences, especially over the last, you know, year or so with the work that you're doing. So Catlin, I'll actually start with you. Uh, can you just tell people who, I don't think, I think bo everyone knows both of you but let's just pretend they don't. Um, can you just tell a little bit about kind of who you are and a little bit of, about your educational experience? Yeah, so I spent 16 years in a public high school classroom and I was about five years in when I thought, oh my gosh, I have made the biggest mistake. This is not what I thought I was signing up for. I think I need to get out of education. 
And that's actually where my blended learning journey began. I started teaching online courses and my interest in technology was peaked. And so I started integrating some of those ideas into my very low tech classroom. And one of the things that was really interesting in my journey early on is because I was in a low tech environment, I had to really rely on the very few devices that walked through the mm -hmm. door with my students. And so everything I designed very early on in that blended learning journey was collaborative. And that has really informed my work around how to use technology moving forward. Um, when I left the classroom, I worked as a blended learning coach. I've been doing that for several years, and now I work in the Masters of Teaching Arts program at Pepperdine, working with teacher candidates and also working globally with educators mm -hmm. trying to make this shift to blended learning. Hey, and, and before I get to you, Katie, I'm going to ask you this question, Catelyn, because this is probably one of the most asked questions I get, you know, in my work in education and uh, you, you obviously alluded to this, something you dealt with. A lot of people talk about this idea of like, you know, utilizing technology, but they don't have the access, like schools don't have the tools. And I think more and more schools now have them because, out of necessity or what they believe to be a necessity during COVID. So to the teacher that says like, hey, I wanna do some of these things, like let's just address this at the beginning. I wanna do some of these things that, you know, are being shared, you know, with technology, but I don't have access. I don't have maybe enough tools for the kids in my classroom. Like how do you actually, you know, suggest they go about that? I mean, I started, I, so I started with student devices and at that point at which I started, I think maybe a fifth of my class might have had a personal device. So I didn't have any devices of my own when I started my blended learning journey. And then I started writing one donors choose project after another. So, you know, I had like a Chromebook in my class mm -hmm. or two or three. and. For me, it was about really connecting students around shared devices and shared tasks. Mm -hmm. And so I use like station rotation and we just have one device at one station and kids totally made it work. So mm -hmm. for me, I, you know, I think it's great we have tech for so many kids now and maybe that's the silver lining of this whole pandemic, mm -hmm. but I don't want to see tech used to isolate learners. Like technology should also be used to connect learners mm -hmm. and I don't see as much of that and I think that's an opportunity in a class where yeah, not everybody has their own device. Yeah, and basically what you just said like when I actually started as an assistant principal, I was almost anti-technology because I saw it doing we actually had devices for um, you know, probably half of our students. So we had like a one to two ratio, but the way that I saw it was using was like, Hey, let's dump kids in a computer lab. Let's have them totally isolate doing typing exercises where they're not even actually properly typing and no one's paying attention to what they're doing. And I was like, this, this is, there's something wrong with this. And so really, the, like, as you said, one of my big, uh, things that I focus on is how do we actually utilize this stuff to, to build relationships to actually like deepen learning. And it doesn't mean that kids are just kind of off on their own. And I think that's some of the pushback because people have seen the negativity of kind of being isolated from everyone else, but there's a really yeah. great opportunity to connect. And speaking of connection, uh, my, my friend and basically sister, I don't know if I should refer to you as my like little yeah. sister or my big sister. I don't, I don't even know your age to be honest with you. Uh, I'm but, 41. Okay. So I guess little, I guess little sister, younger sister. So yeah. <laughs> Uh, but for sure, like, you know, my, my, uh, annoying little sister, that's for sure. Like that is in there no matter what, no, yeah. but Katie no, and I are super tight. Katie, yeah, you, you are very comfortable with that too, which is what I love I'm about you. I'm going to keep it real for you, baby. So. <laughs> that's right. Hey, so Katie, can you just tell people a little bit about who you are? And I know that people have heard you on my podcast before, um, you know, because you've been on several times we've connected and we do like little, uh, like little chats together and stuff like that. Yeah. So just for the people who don't know you, just share a little bit of who you are and your, your experience. Yeah, sure. So I'm Katie Novak, like Catlin, I was an English teacher. I started off in high school. I was in middle school for the last 10 years that I taught. So 13 years full time in the classroom. And one of the things that I saw as I was teaching was just our classrooms were becoming more inclusive and more diverse, which was beautiful. Mm -hmm. But the way that I learned to teach was so one size fits all that I was spending so much time trying to make accommodations and to try to make things work for students. And when I learned about universal design, I you know, was teaching seventh grade. And one of the things that I learned right from the bat was like the most widely replicated finding in all of educational research is that we need different things to learn at high levels. You know, we're not all coming in, you know, with the same interests and mm -hmm. the same ability to learn and the same, um, you know, uh, interest in how we share what we know. And it's just so interesting that for so long we have done education in this one size fits all way, knowing that we're all different. 
And so when I first learned about universal design, I was like, oh my gosh, so you want me to make different things for every single right. student? That sounds absolutely like a nightmare. Like I teach a hundred kids. And, you know, the more I learned about, it's, it's really thinking about what is the goal? What is it that all students have to know or what do they have to be able to do? And it's moving away from the belief that I can be the, I'm the only one capable mm -hmm. of creating these learning environments. Mm -hmm. So UDL is very much about co-creating learning with students, thinking about what really is the goal and what are the potential pathways? Like mm -hmm. what are the ways that students could learn what are the materials that students might need and what are the ways that students could show me they met this goal, but it's actually co-creating that with students of like, this is the goal. This is what you have to be able to do. Mm -hmm. What are some ways that you feel like you could do that really well? And so for me, it was recognizing that if not everyone was doing something at the same time, then I could pull small groups of students to build those relationships, to provide feedback. And that is something that technology will never be able to do. Mm -hmm. Technology cannot replicate that. Um, certainly it's really good at some things, but teachers need time with kids. And I never thought about that as the potential of a blended learning model. And then when you connected Catlin and I, mm -hmm. we were just like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. <laughs> Leveraging both of these frameworks is is something that will prepare every teacher for every twist and every like learning landscape because we know two things. Number one, human variability is not going away. Right. We will continue to have learners who are different from each other, have different strengths, different limitations. Um, they change based on context. And number two, technology is not going away. Right. So we need to have a skill set that allows us to do what humans do best, connect with kids, yeah. allow kids to become more innovative, more expert in their learning because they're competing with robots, but also how can we do this more efficiently using technology right. in the best possible ways? Yeah, and uh, it's actually, and I appreciate, you know, like I, I, I knew both of you, um, you know, in different contexts, you, uh, Katie and I, we wrote uh, Innovate Inside the Box together. Shout out to Katie for writing that with me. Oh yeah, I'm pressing yeah. buttons. That's my favorite button. So, so that yeah, and like what one of the things that um, you know, just working with you really closely, following Catlin's work for such a long time, uh, and and knowing uh, Catlin, there's just seemingly that was like I, I don't know what was going on that day, and I was like, it was amazing because I was like, Katie and Catlin should write a book together, and uh, I think I talked to uh, both of you and. And about like three hours later, it was done. Like that was it, right? Which was Not really the book. cool. The idea for the book. Right? <laughs> well, Not yeah, the book. the book was like the book was like <laughs> three. The book was the book was like three days later, basically <laughs> on your on your writing styles, right? And like the like you, you kind of mentioned something um, about how to you know with utilizing technology and like you know technology alone won't do this. And I remember actually uh, when Khan Academy was becoming really big and people were using this and there was like, oh, like, is this gonna replace teaching? I'm like, if that can replace teaching, then we're not doing a really good job, right? Like if you're, if you're worried about that, that like someone standing in front of like a screen and just like, you know, lecturing on a screen will replace you, then maybe we're not utilizing this, right? I was, I was never like, oh, I'm so scared of that replacing me because i'm like this is like this kind of sucks right like no and i'm sure i haven't looked at it uh con academy i have no idea what it's like now comparatively to when it first came out and there was so much fear about that but i think there there are some there are some really promising practices with the utilization of technology but that does take a teacher like you know really designing those experiences kind of like understanding pedagogy uh things like that so um and i'll, I'll leave this to either one of you to answer so if I was to just say, like, give me just the two minute, like, elevator, I don't, it's like, I hate that term. I don't know why I use it. So just give me kind of like the brief synopsis of like, what is this book? Um, and honestly, it's fantastic. And I, and um, the, the editors just say it's going to be incredible. Um, the people that are reviewing it are, are really pumped about it too. So just tell people a little bit about like what the book is. Okay, I'm gonna jump in first sure. and then you can dovetail on this for me, Katie. Yeah. Um, one of the things that Katie and I talked about is just the initiative overload in education. Mm -hmm. There's so much thrown at teachers and wouldn't it be nice if they had frameworks that will be helpful for the life of their career 
and also frameworks that help them to navigate what is an evolving educational landscape, mm -hmm. right? So sure, the pandemic was awful. It had this um, big disruption on education, but that's there's no guarantees we couldn't end up in a similar situation in six months and a year. And so as Katie and I worked together, it was like, here are these principles and kind of tenets of universal design that are so important, but they can be a little daunting to implement mm -hmm. generally. And then also as teachers are kind of navigating this very fluid situation where they're online, they're in class, they're a blend of the two. So how do we help them understand how to take these universal design principles and these tenants and actualize them using these different models, which from my perspective, and it was so exciting working, working with Katie, because I'm like, I'm all about that teacher realizing that our value isn't in our subject area mm -hmm. expertise. It's not us at the front of a physical or virtual room. It's us connecting with learners. It is that human side of teaching that is so critical. And we need to lean on these models in order to have more opportunities to connect with individual learners, small groups of learners, give them meaningful choices within the design, the facilitation of these learning experiences. So it was just this really beautiful compliment of, you know, anybody who learns about universal design, I mean, can't argue with how valuable that is. I think it's just mm -hmm. how do we implement it in a way that feels sustainable given all of the demands on teachers and this kind of changing landscape that we're in. Katie, you got, what do you got to add to that? Yeah. And I think another thing too, is that, you know, UDL at, at its core is, you know, right now people are designing learning experiences. Everyone mm -hmm. is designing learning experiences, but we're not providing students with equally relevant or valuable opportunities to learn. Mm -hmm. And that is because the way that we're designing wasn't, you know, it's not flexible enough to meet the needs of everyone. So, you know, are we looking for, I think that like there's this friction of talking about like, does this mean everyone's gonna have the same exact outcomes? Right. No, because we know about human variability. And, you know, there will always be people who are stronger at writing and there'll always be people who are taller and they'll always, you know, there is variability, but we shouldn't be able to predict outcomes mm -hmm. based on identity of students. Is that like, we wanna give equal opportunities to access instruction that is rigorous instruction that allows students to learn and share what they know um, and then we'll have you know equal opportunities equal access will result in higher levels of learning but i think that some people want to throw this out because it's like oh there's never going to be a time that every single student performs in the same exact right. way well that is correct because we are not right. robots and so i think that understanding variability and knowing that when students don't have really solid, rigorous opportunities to learn, right. it's often because it's just simply it's not flexible enough. And when we can name those barriers and we can say, you know what, like we can actually design these differently, then more students will learn. So one like really generic example is um, you could say I'm a strong reader. You could label me as a strong reader, but that is only when you give me text in English. And that is only when I'm wearing corrective lenses because I can't see without contact right. glasses. Those just happen to be two things that are always provided to students. And so it's not that I'm a stronger reader. It's like the, the tools that I need are accepted in classrooms. Mm -hmm. And you know what we find with universal design is if a student, for instance, is not reading at grade level, the answer is not just give them a really easy text. It's do they need an audio version? Do they need to read it with a partner? Do we need to pre-teach vocabulary? And so I love the framework because it's thinking about what really are the barriers that students are facing and how can we eliminate those through design? But knowing that so many students are different, pulling small groups really is the answer. And we cannot give every kid what they need when we are meeting or facing 45 kids in a classroom mm -hmm. um, because they don't all need a printed book in English, <laughs> you know, that, that they, right. can, they can see. So I think that if we want to meet the needs of all students, we need to leverage um, instructional design that is not only flexible enough for students to get what they need, but flexible enough to give us time with individual kids and small groups to build those relationships and help them to recognize these are the tools that you need to advocate mm -hmm. for in your learning so you can be successful. Yeah. And like when you're, when you're both talking, the, the one thing that I'm kind of getting from this and you correct me if I'm wrong, is that it's, there's like a framework to kind of like kind of big picture ish 
ideas, but you still want the teacher to work within and like design and have flexibility as opposed to, Hey, we got the answers for you. We're going to totally script everything you do and that will solve everything. And I think a lot of times that's the way some of these ideas are presented to people is like, Hey, if you just use the SAMR model, uh, then, you know, everything will be perfect. And it's like, well, this kid's making TikTok videos. You're calling that redefinition. They already have 5 million followers. So is it really redefinition? And this kid actually, um, struggles reading on, you know, on a paper book, but is fine on an iPad, even though that's, you know, substitution based on that model. And it's really kind of identifying like what the kid needs. And I think one of the things that, you know, um, we talked about a lot in Innovate to the Box, I know comes out to, is that it's not about kids getting all to the same space, but really recognizing their strengths, recognizing their things that they're, you know, they're doing really well. Like, I, this might be a little bit controversial, what I'm going to say, <laughs> but I'm going to say, I actually don't believe, I, I don't believe every kid is going to be good at math. I just don't. I, I, and, and, I, and like, it's like, that's like the most horrible thing to say. No, I like, I, I'm not good at science. And part of the reason is not because maybe I'm not capable. I don't care. I just don't care. I'm not, there's nothing you can do to get me interested in science. Do I know science is really important? hundred percent, but there's people that have those skills. Whereas I have certain skills, talents, and gifts that I think are beneficial to the world too. And I think it's kind of like, Hey, maybe this child struggles with science in this class, but is there ways that within science, I can actually develop that kid. And I don't know what you think of that because it's like, why, why are we trying to make every kid good at every single thing when that's not really beneficial to, you know, humanity, right? Like we all have different gifts. If everyone had was the exact same, like we might as well just build robots. Right. And I think that's, and I don't know if that's like a controversial thing that I just said, cause like, I believe, well, I, I, I believe every kid's awesome and, and has capability to do great things, but I just don't believe every kid is going to be good at the exact same things. And especially at the exact same time. Well, and I think part of the, the the issue is that so often kids don't even get the opportunity mm -hmm. ever really to choose a lens of interest with which to look through. Right. So it's not to say that, like, I'm not particularly strong in math or if you don't like science, okay, but there are things I do care about in my mm -hmm. life where math is part of that. I've just never had the opportunity right. as a learner to say, hey, this is something that's relevant to my life. This is something I'm interested in that deals with this subject. Maybe I can pursue, even if it's just a project right. or a part of a larger unit through that lens, that might make a difference. And I think one of the things that I've really kind of, what's been exciting about the this kind of intersection of working with Katie and exploring UDL and blended learning is, at the heart of blended learning is a shifting control from teacher to mm -hmm. learner. And if we truly want to cultivate expert learners, students who know themselves well, they know what their goals are, they know what their interests are, they know what their weaknesses and their strengths are, then I, I think that's so much easier to support and cultivate in a blended environment where kids have more opportunities to control time, place, pace, and path, mm -hmm. right? Where they say, hey, I don't love science, but you know what? I am kind of curious about this. And I'd love to pursue a scientific inquiry related to this lens of interest that I have, I'm proposing, right? But kids don't get that chance in a lot of classrooms. The, the, and, one, the one thing that you just said, and I, I think about this all of the time and I struggle with this content and I like, will see someone like, Oh, like, you know, design your classroom, like Dumbledore. I don't even know. Is that what it's called in Harry Potter? I don't know. Like, and they're like, yeah, like, <laughs> Oh, like, you know, like have it as a castle and, and do all this stuff. And it's like, so basically I have to like put on shows every day. So, and like have to like, just go crazy and go to the point of like exhaustion. So I get these kids really excited about content so they can do well on a test. And then what happens when the next teacher doesn't do that? What happens when, uh, you're actually asked to like, at some point say like, Hey, can you figure this out on your own? Well, like where's Dumbledore? Like, where's the Dumbledore? Like if you don't, <laughs> if you don't actually like dress it up for me, it's and I, like, I even, I, I talk about this all the time is that when I was, um, my first years of teaching, I actually think I was an amazing speaker, but not necessarily a great teacher because kids would be so entertained by what I was. I could be funny and, you know, uh, really exciting. And then I remember some of those kids the next year, like Mr. Crow is this teacher is like so boring. Like they make us like, 
work through stuff and learn things on her own. I'm like, Oh my God, what did I do? Like, it was just like, it was dependent upon my personality and I, and I'm not against like having a personality and having fun times, but I think it's like, the, like what you said, Catelyn was really important to me is that it's really about teaching the, the student to become the learner because that will better equip them uh, for the next parts of their life, whatever facet, like whether that's personal, professional, you know, whatever they do. I think that that's, that's really important. Um, Katie, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, who was more fun to work with me or Catelyn? <laughs> I just want you or her brother. I, that's not I just a fair wanna, I just comparison. Asking what is more important in cinnamon toast, the cinnamon or the sugar? I mean, it, you can't answer that question. So, oh, okay, I get it. I get it. I get it. I need. <laughs> I guess I'm not the good one. No, I'm just my kidding. high school boyfriend used to have a Ford Escort in like Robin's Egg Blue and he used to pick me up every morning and he had like this plug-in that made like 40 sounds and I was mortified every day because I'd be in the house and it'd be like dun, 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 and I'd be like oh my gosh can you not do that that's the best it's like 6 30 the neighbors are watching <laughs> um, I'm gonna have to send this podcast to him he's a teacher now so this is what I have to say about can every learner be good at something <laughs> what <laughs> you're dodging the question I'm coming back to it because I have a very, very you. interesting thing to say. Okay, I got brother, you. And this is this, is that when we're talking <laughs> about like firm goals, flexible means, right. I think we're talking, we need to talk more about access than being good at something. And I believe that we could design learning so all students could have access to that content. But the, what, you know, the, the question is at what expense? And I think that like, as we think about teaching and learning, we do need to shift away. I feel like we overcorrected to this academic model a little bit mm -hmm. of like, what does it mean to be a well-rounded learner? Mm -hmm. um, I talk to educators all the time who will say, I don't want to provide that flexibility to kids because they're going to choose, quote unquote, the easier thing. Right. So let's mm -hmm. talk math. Right. I know that some students might struggle with like attention or short term memory. So like when we're working on a math um, problem, I can very much say like, okay, as you're working, you can choose to work together. You can choose to use this solution key to kind of check your right. thinking. Here's a link to a Khan Academy video. If you feel like it would be helpful to see it, um, you can revise it, all of those things. Right. And I could make that really accessible to a small group of students. And the pushback that I often get is like, I don't want kids who are strong learners to use those things. But what is so mind blowing to me is I do not commit myself equally to every task throughout my day mm -hmm. is like, you know, I might say like, I really, I really want to focus on like creating this really great learning content or, you know, I really want to be present at my son's lacrosse game, but like, I'm going to put dinner, like I'm going to call it. I'm going right. to be like, oh my gosh, like rotisserie chicken, refrigerated, my house a mess. And like, what I don't think is fair is that we expect students to be like, pedal to the metal, highest levels, challenging. Right. We don't do that as adults. Right. And so I think that when we're talking about like, what does success look like? I equal opportunities to learn, equal access for grade level rigor, um, but also equal hope. Do kids see how they can be successful in your classroom? Right. And if they can't, you're not designing it with them in mind. And so, you know, I think this concept of UDL is not so much like, is everyone going to love it? Is everyone going to be awesome? But can everyone access it? Does everyone have opportunities to look at things and learn things in ways that do play to their strengths? And we can't essentially say that like, we know better than kids know themselves. It's mm -hmm. like, I'm not going to allow that option because I don't think the kid needs it. It's like, well then you're not embracing variability because there are certain times that I need right. a lot more help than others right. just based on my mood and what else I'm dealing with. Um, and so I think that that's important too. So, so basically Catelyn was your favorite. I mean, I think that the long story short, that, that's, that's, is, that was like, if yeah. I could be trapped on an island with someone, it would be Catelyn because you and I would kill each other. Fine. But if I could, <laughs> there, I got here, here you go. They ask you how you are. You just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine. You just can't get into it because they would never understand. <laughs> what is that? I think that's a Kardashian sound, but whatever. Catelyn, no, I'm just, I'm just speak. messing with you. No, I'm just you know how many books we could write on an island alone oh together? Totally. Oh okay, so actually, let's let's actually, and there's so many amazing ideas in this book. 
I know people are going to love it. And I know from working with both of you, it's like, it's, it, it's, uh, I hate saying this. It's not like super academic in the sense that it's hard to read, right? Like I find to me when it's really academic, you lose me. Cause it's like, you want me to read through this and I can't stay awake. Like, I'm sure there's great ideas in here somewhere, but I feel like I'm trying, like I'm trying to read Morris code here. And I I don't like it's, and and if that's the type of book that some people love, that's awesome for them. But I think this is like an, uh, has great ideas, but is also like an easy read. And so Callan, I want to just, a lot of people listening to this and that listen to the podcast, they actually have aspirations of like writing books and both of you have written like several last week, basically, <laughs> you're both very prolific writers. And so kind of like, w- like, what was the experience of writing with somebody else? I, w- with, I guess w- with writing with Katie specifically. Yeah, because I actually have had the experience in another book of writing with yeah. co-authors. I have never had an experience writing um, with somebody like Katie. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am the type A crazy in the mix most of the time. Right. And so I was unprepared for working with Katie. I will say I have to give Katie so much credit. She does the most beautiful job of using analogies and stories Mm -hmm. to help clarify things for people. And that's not something that I frankly felt like I did very well before working with Katie. And I would read, so she would, she would write at night. I would write in the morning Mm -hmm. um, or during the day and I would read what she had read. And I remember I had read, I'd written my first part of chapter one. I just tossed it out. I was like, well, okay, this isn't going to (laughs) work. She started with this amazing story about duck boats. Like I need to raise my game a little bit. And so I got much more comfortable with that storytelling and kind of creating those analogies. And then, man, I was just like, we got through that book in record time because I was just trying to keep up with her. Yeah. Katie, how about you? Like, what was something you picked up from the process with Cal? Oh my gosh. I loved it, loved it, loved it. I, I, you know, I knew what blended wording was like at a superficial level, but in really learning from Catlin, like what is the model? What is it capable of? I'm like so angry that I didn't Mm -hmm. know about it when I was in the classroom. I would have been such a stronger teacher. I would have been able to meet the needs of students. So I think what Catlin always did is like, I would tell these stories, would share kind of like, this is what we know that you need to do in classrooms. And then Catlin, you'd go in and be like, here's 10 ways you could do it. Like, boom, 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 (laughs) boom, boom. And so the book is so heavy on really practical strategies. Uh, you know, I think that sometimes people learn about like UDL and blended learning and it's like, where do I start? And one of the things that Catlin did in every single chapter was just like, here are some places that you could start. And, you know, as with anything that we design, you know, your first lesson that you create is really a prototype. Mm -hmm. And based on, you know, the outcomes, you know, what you're observing, what comes up in assessments, what students are sharing, um, you need to make these adjustments. And so I think that a lot of people, you know, they want to read a book and just be like, boom, I want my practice to be changed. But this is built over the course of careers and it's so co-created with kids that it's really about the willingness to take that first step and to be open enough to say, all right, students, what was the impact and what could we do differently kind of the next time? And so, again, I think that right now teachers recognize the relationships are so important. Technology mm-hmm. allows you to do some things really efficiently, but yep. we lose that human connection and being able to find some balance between, you know, working with a whole class, working individually, working in small groups, leveraging technology, leveraging relationships, whether class is happening in person or right. online or concurrent or hybrid or wherever it is, these two frameworks can help you to take that first step to better meet the needs of more learners. All right, so this is gonna be the last question because I know we're I gotta be aware of time because both Catlin and Katie have like a million people that want to talk to them and do work with them. So I was blessed with this time today. Um, one of the things that you just mentioned, Katie, and I'll, I'll I would love answers from both of you. Basically, because of COVID, um, you know, a lot of people obviously went to, shifted to remote learning, hybrid learning, things like that, and. I think that once basically we can go back where kids are in person full time, I think there's actually things that we're going to continue on doing, right? Like I actually see a lot of uh, virtual professional learning opportunities uh, moving forward, right? Because people have access to things they maybe not have had access to before. They see some uh, validity in it and, you know, but maybe like what we do with uh, Dean Cherescu wrote a really nice post 
talking about like when we're actually together in spaces, we actually have to spend more time together, not just sitting close to one another, but actually spending time with other people in that room. So as we like move forward and this book applies to basically any situation that we're in, like what do you see um, this book helping in kind of variability of like what learning might look like in any of those like blended face-to-face, um, you know, hybrid situations? I I will say the last 15 months, the thing that's been so exciting is that these blended learning models, particularly the rotation models, which we highlight a lot in the book, they're, they work entirely online, entirely right. in the classroom, or this kind of beautiful blend of the two. And so when teachers are going back into classrooms, I want them to retain those things that tech did well, those workflows using things like learning management systems to make resources accessible, um, retain those things, but to pull them back into these classrooms where like you're saying, we're, we're lucky we're gonna get to be together again. Right. We're gonna get to interact. We're gonna get to have that kind of um, social learning happening in a more fluid way when we're in rooms, but like, let's not, let's not neglect those pieces that worked really well. And I think talking about how you universally design these blended mm -hmm. learning kind of experiences has that opportunity of like, we can still grow in our practice. We can still iterate. We can retain the things that worked well in the last year. Um, but hopefully over time, we get more comfortable navigating whatever teaching and learning mm -hmm. landscape we're in to really focus on relationships, focus on learners and making mm -hmm. sure that learners are getting what they need out of the experience. Yeah, and the, 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 the thing that I, I think with the three of us, because I know, like obviously I know my own work, I know the work of yours, is that a lot of people were looking for like band-aid solutions, like what what's a temporary fix to what we have right now? And the reality of it is that a lot of things we've been advocating prior to this worked beautifully during COVID, during remote learning. And they're not seen to be as only for remote spaces. They're not meant to be like temporary holdovers until we can get back. But we've actually, I think, seen opportunity where people are like, hey, this is actually like really good. I've learned from this. And yeah, like when we are face to face, like why would I go away from this? Like why would I not utilize this? And like, of course it looks a little bit different in any space, but like the big, the big ideas behind it are, are really uh, powerful. And so Katie, wh where do you see like, kind of like, what do you see kind of coming up, you know, because of this book, like what, what it's gonna change in classrooms? Um, I think it's inevitable that we're always going to be kind of moving back and forth and in between learning landscapes. You know, right now, New York saying we're not going to do snow days anymore. Right. Certainly, you know, I can imagine. I know that um, as being a district administrator, you know, when you get to flu season, you could have 20 percent of kids absent. Right. Like, I'm, I'm sure that that's going to start triggering like at home learning and things like that. But what I think is going to be really important is the skill set should not be so incredibly different in that, like the what we saw over the past year is people having to pivot tremendously when a district made a call, mm -hmm. like, well, now we're going to be home. Now we're going to be in person. Now we're going to be hybrid. Now we're going to be both. And people felt just absolutely like many people experienced really significant distress about how differently they had to plan based mm -hmm. on those experiences. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we have talked about in the book, and I, I really you know, want teachers to feel that they have the efficacy to just move among and between them. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly something that's going to be built over time, but we shouldn't be designing for in-person learning or designing for online learning or designing for hybrid learning. We should be designing with options and choices that allow for online learning, offline learning, yeah. and therefore it's like flexible enough to navigate these learning landscapes. And, you know, so the, the analogy we use is in Boston, where I'm at, right outside of Boston, um, they have a duck boat tour and the boat <laughs> is a vehicle. It drives on the road, but then it drives right into the water. It's like magical. And so it's like an amphibious vehicle. And we kind of make the really amazingly charming joke that <laughs> our, our own pedagogy should be as fluid as the amphibious duck boat. And that when it's time to go online or when it's time to go in person, it doesn't involve so much of a pivot. You know, okay, so like, I appreciate everything you just said, but I just realized something. Sometimes when you share stories, I'm like, how, how did she bring duck boat into this? 
you were sometimes Helen mentioned it before. right you sometimes remind me of like do you remember jerry Maguire? that kid just would say random things like the uh-huh. human head weighs eight pounds but somehow yeah. you tie it to udl oh my gosh i love that connection He's yeah adorable. i just like you just like i'm like where how did duck boats come into this but you always find a way it's amazing and i do always find a way yeah, and so i've I decided that you know Catlin and i she's most likely to be on a, an island with me we're gonna have so much fun right um i would i'm not invited i get it fighting over the term Turkey at the holiday, like I feel like your and I's holiday banter as siblings would be magical. It would be like the best reality show ever. I would love to watch. It. <laughs> Did you get that little? <laughs> All right, good one. <laughs> Anyways, okay, hey, so I I know Katie's got to go. He's got to call. I just want to say, if you actually said who is the expert in the world in UDL, it's Dr. Katie Novak. Who is the expert? Uh, for blended learning is Dr. Catlin Tucker, uh, that they're together in this book. It is going to be amazing. And I know that it's going to be not, it's going to be super useful to right now, but it's also going to be relevant like 50 years from now, which I think is what I really appreciate. I'm so pumped for this. I am so excited that you two actually just got along so much that <laughs> I have like been pushed out of the circle. <laughs> So I re- the island. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Like, I noticed my texts are going down from Katie. I'm just like you insignificant. Can you can visit the yeah, island. That's fine. That's you fine. Just can't be there all so, on a duck boat. You can just <laughs> duck, duck boat, boat right? it over. Human head weighs eight pounds. So, <laughs> I, I'm so excited for this, and just like I can't wait. <laughs> so, all right, all right, everyone. Thank you for listening to the podcast. I can't wait for this release to come out. Check out in the description. You actually see the link. The book is available now. Thanks for being here. I hope you all have a wonderful day.